here at Distributech 2023, one of the sponsors of these interviews, and these are interviews with thought leaders from around North America and the globe. Uh, our sponsors are H2 Scan. H2 Scan is uh, the leading sensor uh, manufacturer for hydrogen sensing uh, in a lot of different applications and transformers in uh, battery room safety, in uh, processes in safety and in industrial, and in the future hydrogen economy. So I wanna thank our sponsors and I wanna thank all of our guests. And I hope you enjoy this interview. My next interview is with Seth Johnson. He's a vice president, and I'm gonna let you talk a little bit about it, Seth, with uh, PowerSide, is that correct? That's correct. Welcome, thank you. Thank you for having me, Alan. Tell me a little bit about your career, how you got into this industry, and how you got to PowerSide. Yeah, you know, it's it's been a uh, interesting road. I, uh, I I actually never had a desire to get into the power power system. Nobody did. <laughs> Nobody right? is born and said, I'm gonna be in power engineering. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I, um, I went to school, I studied psychology um, and got a degree in psychology and business. Uh, and then my goal was to go into neuroscience. So I started a PhD program in, in uh, neuroscience, uh, worked in research for several years and decided it was not for me. So I, uh, I had a family member who worked in the uh, uh, power industry. They were a manufacturer sales uh, rep. Uh, in Minneapolis, outside Minneapolis, which is where I grew up, and I spent uh, uh, about four years working for them. They hired me as a technical sales rep, um, and I got in and just started absorbing everything. And I'm in the power business now, and I'm. A, I, it's I think, addictive. It is. I'm stuck. Yeah. You yeah, know, I love stuck, it. Yeah. I love it. So. And you're of the generation, Seth, that um, wants to know that they're making a difference because that's how we're attracting people now, not because they're about pay and the fact that we're a pretty secure industry. It's, I want to know I'm making a difference. And, and this industry, that's how we're getting people into it. And you sound like somebody who went from psychology and neuroscience. You're still, you're making a difference, okay? You probably use psychology when you talk to your customers to understand what they think or how they think or what they do. I want to talk about power side because obviously now you're a VP Explain what it is that you do with the company. Yeah, so I'm a vice president and general manager of our uh, corrections business division. So PowerSide, we have two different divisions, one in Montreal and one in uh, Alameda, California. Two different product lines, we're, we're, we're the same company, um, but I manage everything that happens out of the, the Montreal business, uh, which is our power corrections uh, business. So when we find power quality issues and they need to be corrected, that's where the equipment gets manufactured. Okay, now we're going into it. Power quality issues. Um, I was the president of EPRA, the Electric Power Reliability Alliance, before I retired. Okay. And one of my big things was screaming about, hey, all of this change as we add green and clean and as we add electrification of transportation is going to create, I, 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 EPRI told us this in 2001, and they didn't know about all of the change. But the changes that are going on that we're trying to adopt or adapt to in this industry, resiliency, reliability, safety, are creating more power quality issues. So talk about the problem, and then we're gonna talk about a uh, power side solution to it. Sure. You know, the, the problem is it's, it's an ongoing challenge. I mean, we have you know, all these distributed energy resources now that are contributing you know, power to the grid, right? And we're at this point in time where um, being able to understand what's actually happening on the grid, how power is being used, uh, how it's being produced, how it's being consumed, and how it's being stored is so critical to, you know, the, the infrastructure that we have in general, okay? So, you know, the problem essentially is, is that we've, we've really taken, a, you know, coal-fired power plants, you know, high inertia generation, and we're using, you know, transistor-based technology or inverter-based technology, essentially, to create this AC sine wave back onto the system, right? And, uh, you know, doing this at small scale, people didn't really think much of it because it didn't, didn't do a whole lot. But now you're seeing large amounts of it. And so when you think about how energy is being, you know, produced and consumed and then stored as well as we get into, you know, you know DC micro, uh, you know, microgrids and things like that, you know. Um, so, it, you know, the problem is, is that all of these things, this inverter-based technology, you're using high-frequency switching, right, 
to create this sine wave and bring it onto the network, which is creating noise on the, on the grid, on the distribution grid. It's interesting, um, we did some interviews at the uh, RE Plus, which is a conference in Anaheim, and one of the things that came up was how inverter, the, the whole grid being inverter-based technology is affecting the assets themselves. So not in addition to power quality, transformers are not lasting as long as they did because they're not used to, everything used to be step down, right? Not step everywhere. <laughs> you can give it, you can take it, it's, it's kind of a mess in there. The impact of power quality, let's say on the end user, whether that is, let's deal with residential first, and then I want to talk about how uh, data centers might be impacted, how industrial plants might be impacted, but what is the actual impact of bad or poor power quality in a residential environment? So I think when you think about it from a residential standpoint, um, essentially, you know, we're losing inertia essentially on the grid, right? Which is what creates the frequency that, you know, the frequency tolerances in which we, we run the system, right? And so, you know, when you have all of these PV applications that are coming in, you know, you have enough power there, but if there's a big inrush or a big load, it might not be able to sustain the voltage and it might also shift the frequency, right? With the amount of inverter technology putting, you know, like solar, things like that onto the systems, you know, there's harmonics, harmonic content, which, which is a multiple of the fundamental frequency that is there. And that happens with any kind of uh, high frequency switching devices on there. All of that stuff is dissipated as heat in the system fundamentally, right? And so, you know, you think about it from your, your conductors inside of your, in, in your home to, you know, the conductors going to the transformer. And so now you have all of this heat and then it's like, okay, well, what is the long-term effect of this you know, if we have, for instance, high harmonic distortion, you know, in a residential network, which, you know, could also be, you know, the same in, you know, commercial or, or industrial. And in, in the uh, data center market, it's absolutely imperative that they have clean power. A lot of industrial applications now use um, robotics. Robotics are impacted by, you know, bad power quality. They get the power, but they, and you don't want a bunch of robots that are that are welding on parts of a car. Suddenly, one of them goes, huh, huh, right? You can't have that, right? So we hear that a lot. That the industrial power quality issues are growing. In 2001, EPRI did a did a, they projected by uh, the next decade. So we've already passed that time. The the dollar loss of power quality issues uh, in industrial America. And it was somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 billion annually. It's a lot of money that industry is going to lose and they're having to be competitive, they're having to do it. So that's the problem. How does PowerSide deal with that problem? Yeah, well, you know, you made an interesting point there when you're talking about, you know, robotics and controls. Uh, you know, what we see is, you know, you know, go back, you know, 30, 40 years where you have these big induction motors, right, at, at these high, heavy industrial facilities where, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're doing, um, you know, their, their production process, right? It was all induction-based motors, transformer-based welding. Now it's inverter-based welders. You have variable speed drives, uh, variable frequency drives, DC drives, all of that stuff, which is controlling motors. All of that stuff allows the motor to become a little bit smarter, right? You can, you can do different things with it. But it creates another issue, which is, again, this, this kind of harmonic content on the network. And the other thing that's really interesting is one thing that we're looking into is um, high frequency emissions, okay? And these are high frequency noises that are in the bandwidth of nine to 150 kilohertz, right? So very high frequency. So you'll get into these in industrial plants. We did a, um, a study at a plant, plastic extrusion facility, and they had um, a 10 kilohertz voltage of around 25 volts, okay? So it's this very, very high frequency voltage, which nobody can really pick up. A lot of people can't. The good news is in many cases it gets dissipated. It can't flow through the transformer back on the grid. The downside is, is that the control that is telling all the equipment to do things, it's, it's frying. You know, the circuit boards are frying, capacitors are blowing up, you know, in these, in, these, uh, in these control boards, so on and so forth. So what we do to correct that is, you know, we, we're, we're kind of unique. So we, we're in detection and correction, okay? So we actually manufacture 
a, a, a very high quality, uh, power quality monitoring device, metering device, does waveform capture, uh, waveform sampling. We can do high frequency emission testing, look at those very high noises. And then on my side of the business, we do the correction, right? And so for us, what we do is we have a power system analysis program where we'll go send these things out, go get data in the field, and then come up with a solution. So for us, you know, we're using um, things like active harmonic filters, uh, passive filters, um, capacitor banks for power factor correction, um, and we'll even do high pass filters for you know, supra harmonics or these high frequency noises that, that, uh, that pose themselves as issues in these, uh, in these low voltage distribution grids. Uh, I love it, detection. What was the first? Detection, Detection and correction. Correction, I like that. Yeah. That's what I should have used with my children <laughs> when I was raising them. I detect what you're doing wrong and I'm going to correct what you're doing wrong. I, I did the detection part really well, didn't do much of the correction part. Um, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot right now because I would love for you to write an article, a technical article, I'd love to publish it, uh, about the issue and about some of the detection methods and some of the correction methods that the industry needs to be aware of. Now, obviously, they'll point to PowerSide, but it cannot be a PowerSide article. I'll put you on the spot for that one. Um, one of the issues that everybody is having, whether you're a supplier to the industry or whether you are the utility industry, is labor. That is one of the, the storms on the horizon. We, right now, it's bad, and it's not going to get easier. And that's from everything, the unskilled technician to the skilled techs, skilled trades, linemen. You know, every issue is everybody's trying to get more of and compete with. You have the detection and the correction. How is it, how can it help the labor shortage or how can it help the people in the company work better, work smarter, work faster? Because you got to be part of the whole, right? So in the detection, you got to be using input from the people in the company. How are you um, helping them do their jobs better? Yeah, you know, so for us, I mean, in general, it's equipment uptime, right? When we get, get into the correction side of things, right? Equipment uptime. But we can't do that unless we can detect what the problem is, you know, fundamentally. We don't know what the issue is. Um, so from, from a, you know, from a, from a process perspective, our goal is certainly to, to improve efficiency of, of these facilities, you know, decrease waste, right? So when we do power factor correction, you know, we're able to allow customers to, to draw less current in their system and improve their efficiency of the system uh, that they have. And then also improve the integrity of, of the system in general. So when we're talking about harmonics and how that might uh, perpetuate through, through the elect electrical system itself, you know, you could see how, okay, you know, a lot of customers will go in and they say, oh, we have to replace this every, every three weeks. We just have to replace it, right? I mean, that plastic uh, extrusion facility I was telling you about, they just replace all their drives every three weeks, every three weeks. Yeah. You know, you're talking millions of dollars a year, millions of dollars, right? So when you can go in and with a solution and say, hey, no, this is your issue, this is where it's at, and this is how we can fix it, you know, you know you're a hero in, in that scenario, right? Um, which is really where we play in. So we, you know, we're not an engineering services company, but we provide a lot of very specific knowledge for, and specific application knowledge for what it is that we do. The interesting thing, um, when, you, when you just mentioned that, uh, when, you, when you help somebody do their job better, so the maintenance manager, the director of maintenance must love you. In that instance, right? They must say, yeah. oh my gosh, because they thought doing the right thing was replacing them every three weeks. In their mind, that's what they do. When you say you don't have to do that, there's a better way. Um, typically, because the maintenance departments are always behind. <laughs> there's always work that has not been done because they can't get to it, because they don't have a lot of staff. So if you make that department more efficient by making the equipment, you also mentioned something about um, getting the data from the equipment, which is the detection part, to be able to correct um, is much more of operator-driven reliability. And that's really what part of our passion at APC Technologies is, is give the operators more of an opportunity to manage their own system, right? and then don't have a department that comes in and does maintenance. But anyway, that's brilliant. Uh, lastly, but, but uh, not 
finally, because we will reach out to you in, uh, for, for another edition. Technology is changing rapidly. You see it because you guys, you see the detection part of it. The use of AI, the, you know, we've kind of adopted IoT. It was, it was new and everybody talked about it, what, three years ago, four years ago. Now IoT is old hat. We accept it in the utility industry. From a standpoint of technology, what is next that we are, have to accept into the industry? You know, I think, you know, if we're going to look at this, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, I mean, you know, fundamentally what I believe is going to happen is, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about energy being pr produced, consumed, and stored. Right. Well, essentially, you know, this, this smart grid is going to, you know, come into play. And, you know, we're going to be pulling power from things like, hey, the utility is going to know your car's plugged into the wall. They need to supplement power over here. They'll pull power out of your vehicle, right? Or, you know, whatever it may be, you know, in general, your battery storage, so on and so forth. So I think it's, you know, I heard it one way that, that you know, the utility grid in a way is getting smaller in a way, right? Uh, and, the, and I said, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. What do you mean? They're like, well, we're going to get rid of all this centralized generation. It's going to be all of this stuff, you know, all kinds of decentralized generation, wind turbines, solar, all of this, all this stuff. And I said, yeah, that, that's right. But what do you mean by getting smaller? He said, well, fundamentally, I don't mean it's going to get smaller, but it's going to become, um, it's going to become more vulnerable, right? Ah, yes. And so I said, okay, that's, that's really interesting, you know? And, and ultimately, I believe, you know, technology is always going to get better. The inverter technologies, whatever, you know, whatever it is that we're using, you know, long-term in 10, 15 years from now. But is it going to be good enough, right? And that's where, you know, that's where I think our business plays in, and that's where we have our play in the market. But I, I fundamentally believe the level, the smart grid, and the way things are, are, are going to be you know, in, in 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to change the way that we produce, consume, and store energy. Produce, consume, and I love you got these detection, correction, produce, consume, <laughs> energy. Seth, it has been a delight. What Thank a pleasure. You. It's been Thanks, Seth Alan. Johnson. Appreciate it very much. This has been an APC Technologies production and we thank you for joining us. Our sponsors have been H2Scan and Distributech. And of course, the communities of APC Technologies, which is Transform Technology, Power Systems Technology, Green Energy Technology, and Women in Power Systems. So thank you. Mm -hmm.